Hello and welcome to this session, Radio Killed the Video Star as part of Expo North's Expo North 2022 conference. Um, really pleased to be here um, with three great panellists. Uh, um, uh, delighted could join me, um, Thea, Dan and Colby, and um, uh, we're going to meet them in just a moment. And we're going to be talking about all things audio, and it's really about the enduring popularity and relevance of audio as a medium, as a, a media medium, um, but also like how we relate and interact with that in our lives. Um, uh, so just to, to uh, explain who I am, I am Dougal Perman. I uh, run a content company called Inner Ear, which um, creates a lot of content across the creative industries and the cultural world in general. Um, and while we do um, work extensively in video and um, make live video programs, live stream events and, um, and create a lot of video content, we began in audio, um, started with an internet radio station called Radio Magnetic and um, still uh, work with podcasts and create audio walking tours and um, are very passionate about audio. And in uh, my other, uh, well, I should say that through um, Inner Ear, I do quite a lot of consultancy in digital media development and through that work on an ongoing basis with Expo North. And I get to work on all kinds of different interesting projects there. Um, and um, I, I love Expo North for its um, confluence of creative industries interests and um, it's fascinating um, opportunity to immerse yourselves in things and um, uh, in my other business life I chair a trade body the Scottish Music Industry Association and um, work a lot across industry and um, uh, and government ways on there which is really interesting um, so let's uh, let's meet our other panelists. Um, Thea, can you start, please, and tell us a bit about you and um, and and I guess you know how how you work with audio. Um, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Thea. I'm a Glasgow-based Californian, hence the other West Coast accent. My background actually is in radio, going back to 1989, college radio in America before I moved here. Um, these days, I'm a trainer, a blogger, and a publisher. Um, I'm Scotland's only Canva expert, if you know what that is. Canva is an online graphic design tool, and I train people how to use it and self-publish books. Um, and I'm currently finishing a Brit Hits of the 80s book, uh, which is an activity book, a quiz book and word search and that kind of thing. And, and that's an aid of living here for 30 years this very week. So happy anniversary. And uh, thanks for having me. Uh, in terms of what I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll, I'll explain more kind of how I use audio, but I'm, um, I'm a voice, voice addict, I would say. So whether that's um, podcasts, um, audiobook, listening to audiobooks, um, and uh, doing voice notes. I do voice notes all day long. We'll get to that point later, but um, that's pretty much me. I'm Thea. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet everybody. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, Dan. Dougal, thanks very much. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me on the panel today. Um, I'm Dan Holland. I am co-founder of Adventurous Audio. We're a Highland-based um, podcast production company. Um, and we kind of started business um, about halfway through the pandemic. So um, we've, as everyone else is moving to digital audio uh, in the pandemic, we made that production transition as well. A bit like Thea, my audio background uh, starts in radio. Um, I've worked for BBC Scotland for about 20 years as a radio producer across a, a variety of different productions, primarily for Radio Scotland. These were um, live magazine shows, outside broadcasts, and a lot of feature documentary. So fairly crafted storytelling production. And, and now within with Adventurous Audio, um, my co-founder Penny Stewart and I focus on Productions that are uh, kind of in-depth story narration. Um, some of them are uh, we produce present, but some of them are client productions where they have an idea and come to us and we help develop that idea, help them craft a narrative um, and how that story will evolve over 
whatever number of episodes we're looking at. Um, so that's my that's my sort of audio background, and um, hopefully across the next hour or so we'll, we'll have lots of chance to talk about different examples of of audio we've all love and hear. Wonderful, thank you, and Colby. Hello, I'm uh, Colby Robertson. Uh, my pronouns are they them. Uh, I got my start sort of in the audio world back at much like here in um, in uh, student radio, uh, fresh air, the radio station over in Edinburgh. Um, uh, I was the head of production there for um, a number of years. Um, I then moved on in my career to become a broadcast uh, engineering apprentice, so um, audio and radio um, broadcasting engineering. Um, and uh, now I find myself working as a technical architect for uh, BBC Sounds, um, obviously a major platform for uh, audio content. Um, and in addition to that, I uh, am a musician in my spare time. Um, so I play uh, drums and several other instruments, um, and I have uh, produced uh, EPs and albums for various bands. So that's sort of my all your background. I'm really happy to be here. Looking forward to having a chat with the other panelists. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so there's there's so much that we could get into with this, and I think um, thinking about. Thinking about all of this and, um, you know, an interesting kind of um, common background in different forms of radio and then um, uh, expanding in, in different avenues for each of us. Um, when thinking and, uh, and especially in respect to, well, well, we'll talk a bit later about how audio is consumed, but, um, you know, it's interesting thinking about platforms like BBC Sounds and, and others that, uh, podcast platforms and um, lights of Audible. Um, but uh, when we think about audio for a way of um, dispersing information, um, whether that's news, current affairs, features, um, or, um, or entertainment um, as well, um, how, how is it, you know, how is audio used, you know, or you know, how do you think audio is used well? Um, what works best and what formats? And Dan, from your experience, both both from your experience in your your first career, if you like it, you know, at the BBC and now um, as a, an independent production company. I think audio is sort of in news and dissemination of information. And overall, it gives you immediately it gives you a couple of things audio always gives you immediacy far quicker than visual production can do it can give you intimacy with a person or whoever you're hearing from and it gives you a reality as well because and i'm sure theo will come on and talk about voice later on but when you hear the nuances and the changes in someone's voice when they tell a story that's something that you don't necessarily get in visuals. You may get body language in visuals, of course, but the voice is something very powerful. I think we could look at this at kind of two scales. And if I give you a couple of examples with each on, on the micro scale, if we go back to um, the start of the pandemic, where information was flying around really, really quickly and it was always being updated and it was quite hard, I think, for everyone to, as we've subsequently seen, keep on top of what were the rules and regulations. But if I give you an example of what happened where I am in, in Wester Ross, um, Two Locks Radio and Lock Broom FM, community radio, brought together a small core of people and they started producing daily updates, which went out on the radio and they shared them on social media with um, bringing up to date, really, really local COVID information for people. Where could they get a test? When was the fire station open to get those tests? And they it, they spoke to some of our GPs, for example, to try and relay some information direct to them. They did, it was really successful, but it brought some real benefits. Firstly, because they focused really, really local in that micro scale, they addressed something that local news couldn't do through audio, just because of the scale and the geography of the islands. They also access an audience who were perhaps radio traditional listeners, but maybe don't go onto social media for their information. Maybe they don't get a daily national newspaper anymore. And as we saw too, 
the daily national newspapers were out of date by the time they'd run through the printers. So on a micro scale, audio can give you incredible intimacy and immediacy as well and can help you access a huge audience. But let's boost that up to a macro scale and think about perhaps remember back to the fall of Kabul and those dreadful scenes we saw of everyone evacuating then. And Lise Doucette did a, a podcast called A Wish for Afghanistan, which was on BBC Sounds. And I'm sure Colby will um, be able to tell us more about. But audio there gave Lise a, a way to be able to talk to people whose voice wouldn't necessarily otherwise be heard. Because in that environment, she spoke to an awful lot of women in this podcast, and they were some of the most powerful stories you will hear. And I would question whether those women would have been able to speak and tell those stories if it wasn't for audio. So you take that up onto a big scale and those stories have gone global. And and when you start to think about that bigger scale thing and you think about some of the events that we're sadly seeing in Ukraine now and with Ukraine cast as a as a podcast, that is bringing um, some really personal stories through audio, which would be hard to gather, again, potentially for identification reasons um, in, an, in other mediums. And I was listening to a, a lady just the other day, Natalia, who I think has appeared on Ukraine cast quite regularly. And she was talking about her husband as one of the fighters trapped in the, uh, in the Mariupol steelworks. And, but she didn't know what had happened to him or where he was. And she relayed this in audio through podcast. And it was just... You know, it was so, so powerful to hear one person speak and tell a story in their own first person voice. There was no there was no commentary or analysis from anyone else. It was just a powerful, powerful conversation. Um, and I think that's where audio can give us something different. Can And people say audio is dead, radio is dead. But you know what? It keeps reinventing itself. It keeps coming back. It evolves. And I think this is the latest evolution that we're seeing in it, to be honest. Yeah, brilliant um, points there. And um, wonderful examples. And I think that, yeah, the the reason I, I yeah, tongue-in-cheek called this session Radio Killed the Video Star is because of that uh, radio's never died and, it, and oh, it, it never right. will, you know. And, and it's that immediacy and that ability to, to respond so quickly, so immediately. Uh, and Colby, you were nodding a lot um, during what Dan was saying there. I mean, is this something that you, you're seeing with your work with BBC Sounds? Yeah, so I, I'd like to pick up on a couple of points that, that Dan made. Um, uh, firstly, the kind of uh, what Dan was talking about on the various scales where, um, where audio can reach you. Uh, certainly during the pandemic, we noticed a massive uptick in the use of uh, our local radio stations. Um, so they were they were useful for our um, listeners because they have like hyper local information and our journalists on the ground know what's happening in a particular area. And um, uh, over the last few years, we perhaps had the usual um, uh, suspects uh, saying that you know radio is dead or local radio is dead. Um, but certainly, um, in our experience, that uh, the feedback we get from our listeners is that um, uh, that those services are absolutely crucial in, in uh, uh, emergency situations like that. Um, and so uh, that's sort of um, a very local um, effect of how audio can make a difference for people. Um, another thing I'd like to pick up on that I think Van uh, uh, very rightly pointed out is the, the sort of penetration that audio can have in different situations. Um, so um, I think that's partly a technological factor. I mean, I, I work in technology, so I could probably look at it that way, but um, uh, it, it, it is far easier to get to where the story is with a microphone and a recorder um, than it is to go with a full camera set up. And it's easier to send it back to back to your uh, uh, broadcaster or um, publish it online or anything like that because it's um, just an easier medium to work with. And that, that, um, that ease of use that the medium has means that it can absolutely penetrate into uh, places where there are untold stories and uh, uh, give voice to people that might not otherwise get that. And I think that's um, that's a really uh, powerful feature of audio as a medium. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, 
I, it is that it, it is just you know the, this immediacy and this this uh, agility to be able to respond really quickly um, is is so powerful. It's so useful and um, and just because you know something that you said there made me think that um, it, I once uh, it reminded me of a, once I was working on an, an amazing podcast um, project making a documentary about um, um, an art, a music and arts collaboration between Brazilian and UK musicians and artists. And there was in, we were in a restaurant in Sao Paulo and the photographer working on the same project um, picked up the audio recorder I had on the table and went, what you, what you do is really easy, isn't it? You just, you just point that at people and they speak. And, um, and I looked at him, picked up his camera, took a picture of him and said, yeah, so is what you do, you know, because it's not, it's not the, um, it's not the, the ease of using the tools. It's what you do with them and what you create. And, and you've both mentioned some um, really inspiring and important examples of how audio is used to, uh, to communicate information. Um, Thea, is this something that, you know, that you as an, an avid consumer of, of, of audio, but also, um, in your work, are you, um, how do you see audio as a, a, an information tool or medium? Oh, I think I think you've all made some really excellent points. I just even during the pandemic, I certainly did start to consume more local news and audio forms to get that hyper local. Even though I'm in Glasgow, which is a lot bigger than maybe parts of the Highlands, I was still tuning in for that that local hyper local type of, of news and and whatnot. Um, I, I'm I'm just more of a consumer in that in that side of things rather than a disseminator of information through through voice, unless it's through more of a networking side of things, which I think we'll get to a bit later, Dougal. So I don't have a huge amount to to input to this part of the conversation. No, thanks. I mean I think we will we will get into that, the networking and um uh, although, um, yeah, the, the networking and what you alluded to earlier about um, the use of um, voice as a, a, a messaging um, medium. Um, and, and then, Dan, you, you taught us particularly about telling the untold stories and with Ukraine cast and, um, and Lisa Sets. Uh, reports from around the world and when um, she's reporting particularly in conflict areas are are so captivating um, and the, the way that she, you know her description um, yeah. but also the people she speaks to um, but um, audio for storytelling you know how, how is it what, why is it a, a favourite medium for you and and thinking about um, something I wrote in the description for this, this session, but um, something that I've heard, particularly actually heard filmmakers say that audio is the most visual medium. And um, uh, um, my partner was just um, sort of slightly challenging that and saying, well, what, what about the written word? You know, and I suppose it probably depends how, uh, how one's brain responds to things. But I, I definitely find I get so immersed in a story when listening to it that I imagine so much more than I think I would when reading. But um, yeah, how, how do you get into audio as yeah. storytelling? I, I think that's a really, really valid point and that you make about how um, you paint pictures and how the written word can do that as well. I was um, lucky enough um, in my of so my early years at the BBC to work with someone who was visually impaired as a producer, a visually impaired presenter. And when they started describing to me what they could hear, it painted a completely different picture. And that was something I took away um, with me and I still use it. If someone says to me, how do you want me to describe this or whatever? I said, well, just imagine I'm blind. Imagine I can't see it. And then tell me what I, what you can see. And straight away, people's descriptions come to life. They become more vivid. They become more layered. They become more colourful. 
And that, as a tool for storytelling, is it starts to give you a bit of a gift, um, really. I think in terms of using audio for storytelling, once you, once you have got your arc and what you're going to tell, then it's just down to the creativity of how you're going to tell it. What are you going to use to tell it? And a lot of that will go down to your, to your background research. What information have you got to be able to do it? To be able to create different layers within your story, sub stories even as well. But in its simplest form, then using a really strong story arc, audio gives you a much easier way to be able to move forward, backwards, sideways within that arc and come back to places that um, perhaps I would argue other mediums might make that slightly harder to do. To give you an example, um, we, we produced a podcast for um, the Leave Hume Center for, sorry, Leave Hume Research Center for Forensic Science at Dundee University called Inside Forensic Science. And this took uh, an unsolved historic murder case in Dundee from 1912, a lady called Jean Milne, who sadly was very brutally murdered in her home. But in the archives, there were all the police files, all the witness statements, all the original police documentation, all the productions from the case that we used. So when it comes to storytelling, that is a real gift because you can start to bring those people back to life. And going back to what Thea said earlier on as well, when you hear someone's voice, you start to connect with them and you start, people start to come alive much more. If I were just to tell you about perhaps the, the police officer who went and investigated this or found the crime scene, but if you hear that characterized in voice, it becomes something different. Um, so we, we use that as a medium and, and another example um, we're working on a project at the moment um, with Ullapool Museum. We got a, um, a, a grant fund from the Audio Content Fund, which I should just sort of give a wee punt to and say a terrific thing to promote and support small independent production companies, which sadly it sounds like might be no longer. But this is a project that Ullapool Museum have been working on um, about a cleared glen in, uh, near Ullapool. And through their two year project of trying to bring this glen back to life and discover what they know about it and through archival research and, and digs, we're working on a project with them to try and bring some of the characters of that glen back to life in a kind of an eight by 15 docudrama. So audio for storytelling gives you this opportunity to, to pull out on little nuggets. And if you can bring people to life in different ways, then, then you have this this real opportunity and intimacy. And I think it was um, Ira Glass I was reading from This American Life said just recently that it's easy to connect to audio because you have feelings. We are all emotional beings and we all interact in our different way. So if I as a producer can bring that alive, I would lay down money that the four of us would all interact and have different emotions and a different connection to some of these characters that hopefully we're going to bring to life in this production hidden in plain sight um, which will tell the story of a community that was vibrant and um, had illicit stills it had witchcraft who would bring down mist to hide the still from the excise men when they came visiting from dingwall you know and when you bring start to bring that alive through audio docudrama you get something very very special um, and or I think you get something very, very special. So a very long answer to your question, Dougal, but, you know, audio and storytelling is something that is, I think, really special in long, in short form or in long form. But it's very, very different, even if you compare that. And I'm absolutely not trying to beat um, visuals or film, um, given the title of the, the conversation. But if you think about long form storytelling in film or TV or visuals, it's still a completely different beast. And we all get something different from that again. So I think audio for storytelling, it, it's a natural home for it, it if you are, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think um, the I love the, the sounds of that project you're working on. And um, 
I will, I'll definitely go and experience it. I, when I've gone to museums and other kinds of visitor attractions and there's been um, use of audio, um, even sometimes with sound effects, but um, sometimes dramatization of particular scenes. I'm quite fond of, even though it's it's you know it's perhaps a little old and needs updated. I'm quite fond of what they've done at Inverary Jail, um, and uh, there's a, a court uh, room uh, drama enacted there, and the, the use of audio is very nice in that. But I think what you're talking about is way deeper than that, and. Um, uh, I'm I'm just very intrigued, but I think I think it is a natural home for it. It is, and and I think what it enables you to do, and forgive me for butting in again, is it, it, you you can get into the mind of your audience, and if you mm. can work out really who your audience is, and then you can what flicks their switches, get into their mind, and then you can craft your story, craft your audio directly to them, and that's kind of a beauty of podcasting i think in that you're where radio you used to speak to an awful lot of people but with podcasting you can speak to an individual and if you can get into the mind of that individual and you can craft that story to that individual again you give something much richer you have a greater connection and it's that connection and that um getting into the mind and the the emotive aspect of it is you know that makes an experience immersive, I think. Absolutely. And, um, and uh, Colby, is that something that, um, you know, is that the way that you might describe a lot of the content on BBC Sounds and that sort of immersion that you get that's very different to consuming um, live broadcast radio? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I think I, to touch on uh, kind of what, you, what you've all been saying um, prior, uh, all you is a very visceral medium. It, it, um, you know, we've all been out and about and caught the opening in, opening chords of a song or heard the cry of a child or something like that and just immediately get transported to a particular time in your life and, and, and you're fully there in your mind's eye and that that uh, viscerality is what makes um, audio storytelling so powerful. Um, uh, and with regard to BBC Sounds, I listen to um, a very immersive um, uh, piece uh, around the uh, migrant crisis in the Middle East. And um, it, 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 the audio was from one of the uh, makeshift boats making their way across the water. And then um, uh, uh, I had headphones on at the time and I could hear, you know, I could hear crying, I could hear the waves, I could, hear, I could uh, feel the peril there um, for the people that were there. And, and uh, I found that very powerful and very moving. Because it's quite easy to watch um, the sets of hot news or the kind of hot news uh, on your television set and feel a sense of detachment from it. Um, but uh, uh, with headphones on, uh, going about your daily business uh, uh, on your commute, um, almost anywhere, that, that kind of pattern of consumption that, that audio has, you can be transported to someone else's experience uh, almost right away with audio. And I think. Um, uh, the producers that we have um, uh, in BBC Sounds and in, in our radio outlets are, are, you know, masters of using that medium effectively to get stories across. And um, uh, I think that's a really powerful thing. And you only have to look at the, the popularity of like the, the True Crime podcast, you know, across loads of platforms to really um, entice people in and grip them in a, in a story, you know, real or otherwise. Um, uh, and uh, um, that popularity really speaks to how powerful um, audio is as a storytelling medium. And what about um, interactive elements? Is that something that you've seen any kind of move towards in platforms? I, I, I think um, I think that's probably in its infancy uh, in my line of work at the moment. Um, uh, most of our most of our output is primarily focused on. Um, uh, either live or on-demand audio. Um, I think interactivity is an interesting thing, and I wonder whether that might come more from the kind of uh, game development side of, of uh, media rather than uh, uh, radio. But certainly, um, it's a, it's an element of storytelling that could be particularly useful uh, and make audio more immersive. Um, 
because if you can have an inter a sense of inter interaction with the the police, um, then that would definitely make it more immersive. Yeah. There's, there's actually it reminds me of there's a few examples of this that I've found with audio where dramatization of um, like essentially choose your own adventure stories that have been done um, in an audio format. And then um, uh, my company made one once for a whiskey brand we we're working on, which is kind of a quirky way of telling the story of the life of um, one of the founders of the company. And um, we'd based that on a few different examples we found in kind of podcasting and there was one there was one um i forget who was behind it but it was narrated by anna friel and it was um it existed as an audio drama um in modular sections i suppose episodic but um you chose what to listen to next based on the decisions you made about what the characters should do and they were the way they did that was really simply um, there were all these different um, uh, chapters, I suppose, in the story um, in Spotify, but each of them had a coded name. And so you had to mm -hmm. search for that code. Um, and I think using a platform and then um, just coming up with a, a kind of relatively simple mechanic like that um to bury a story that you could actually i mean i i also knew a production company who I, I still never really managed to work out how they did this but they created a story which started as an audio podcast and then they actually did a visual version of it as well but they designed it in such a way that you didn't well you you could make a decision in it in that you could listen to it in any order uh, of any of the chapters in any order and it would make sense somehow um, which is a bonkers idea from the storyteller. I hate to be trying to produce that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, just the, how you get out of one and into the next. Um, incredible. But um, I uh, I think you're you're right, Colby, that probably that is going to be driven by the gaming world more. But, but again, it seems to be an example of where audio, because, you, you know, you don't need to think about um, the whole visual aspect of making of, of film and TV and, and video production. Um, you've got uh, a bit more agility to, to move fast. Of course, the, the quality and the content and the how you create that immersive experience needs to be absolutely on point because you've nothing else to distract the mind with. Um, but uh, thinking about the interactivity, um, Thea, you've been you know, very active in, in using audio as a, a way of discussing, you know, of a discussion tool. And I, actually it does seem a bit funny as having this conversation um, on a video platform um but it um yeah i did wonder if we were going to be just audio only given that yeah. it was but oh well here we are um <laughs> well we um, could have we could have done it just audio only but it would have been so so this is a little bit more audio. dynamic doing yeah. it this way yes absolutely but, but you have done a lot of audio only discussion. Ton, a ton of audio only discussion two two things to kind of recap kind of what we've been saying as you guys were talking and about immersive experiences, I'm going all the way back to a birthday circa 1986. I went to Alcatraz and you had the headset and you do that tour. And so, and it does bring up all, all kinds of chills as you go into the jails and you mentioned in Drury jail. And I was like, yeah, I suddenly had a flat speaking of, you know, Colby was saying you can hear something and it brings you back to a person, place mm. or time. And that, I think that's called the milestone theory. At least my favorite radio presenter in the 1980s, Frank Andrick, told me that once that you can, you know, you hear something and it brings you back to that time. Anyway, sorry, just to, I had to digress to, to Alcatraz back home. Oh, and that is a really good point, because I think actually probably the uh, audible sense and smell are probably the two most evocative senses yeah. for or for triggering memory, um, much more so than our other senses. 
For sure. So yeah, sorry, I had to just go back back to that. Um, but uh, it's flashback. Um, yeah, so I I am a big fan of things. I think during the pandemic, I discovered um, Clubhouse, which some of you may have heard, which is an audio only platform. And I went on it in January of 2021. And I immediately became addicted. And I was on it seven days a week. I literally because I live alone, it was pandemic, we were isolated it became kind of a bit of a lifeline for me. And on that tool, you can find rooms about anything you're interested in. And, you know, a lot of people complained it was only Bitcoin and, and um, property people, but, you know, I, I was in rooms, you know, meeting people about print on demand who I later came to work with people in that area. I stumbled into a Ted Lasso room, which is an Apple TV show. And uh, that was that first week I joined and I've not missed it every Sunday since, or maybe I've missed one since January, 2021. And, and, and we even um, started a conference. I, so I like became friends with the people that had first started the room. And the three of us co-founded an international conference for fans of this TV show and stuff we've never met in person. And funnily enough, they're in the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm from. And I'm going to be meeting them in a, in a couple of months, hopefully in time for season three kicking off. But I mean, anyway, do you, do you even know what they look like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I do, because I've now connected to them on social media. One of them is a yeah. New York Times bestseller likes, but I didn't didn't care about that. Mm. I was just talking to these guys for a couple of weeks. And then you go and you look them up. And you're like, oh, my gosh, this guy actually is a big venture capitalist. OK, so he's really cool. He's called Chris. But anyway, so, yeah, I, I that didn't matter because we were kind of connecting on voice. But I myself have hosted rooms about 80s music. Um, I've run networking groups. Um, I've got clients through Clubhouse, through through voice. Right. So, you know, you don't you you can learn things by just being in the rooms like when it first started, I, you would have interviews with people like the guy, one of the founders of Reebok, for instance, or Vanilla Ice, like I kid you not, a very interesting room, right? So we were at this point, we were already kind of starting to get Zoom fatigue and stuff, weren't we? So we were kind of craving, craving that connection with people. And I wanted to just circle back to uh, there's an article on Forbes called the rise and fall of social audio will continue to impact the entertainment industry for the next generation. I'm just going to read this one quote because it does talk, it kind of encapsulates a lot of what you guys have all been saying, what we've all been saying, but this is coming from Clubhouse in that Forbes article. And it says the intonation, inflection, and emotion conveyed through voice allow you to pick up on a nuance and form uniquely human connections with others. You can still challenge each other and have tough conversations. But with voice, there is often the ability to build more empathy. And so I just thought that that was a beautiful kind of summation of voice. Like, I feel like in a way, networking through voice, we don't have the judgments of seeing what they look like or whatever, but we we still kind of make judgments, I guess, by people's voices, but we can kind of just, we, we don't have necessarily those blockers, if that makes sense. So I think voice is, is an amazing, obviously, an amazing um, tool, if you will. Yeah, and you you touch on a lot of uh, really strong points there. I mean, Zoom fatigue is is one. You know, but Zoom is a great platform. It's it's brilliant for um, uh, for video meetings, you know, and it's quite good for webinars. I would say. It, um, I think other platforms, um, you know, could have a better user experience than the Zoom in that respect. But it's very good for, for video meetings, and for whatever reason, it became the ubiquitous platform when the pandemic blew up. And um, you know, I'd used it a bit before. We used it um, for linking up some um, interesting um, uh, interactive live stream stuff, but um, it. It is, it is just one platform for one purpose and, and people have bent it to fit so many different things and it's the de facto thing, all right, should we get on Zoom? And you know, and sometimes people will say to me, um, oh, do you want to jump on a Zoom call to discuss that thing? I said, no, I'll phone you. Um, or <laughs> That's what we also, did to talk about this, isn't it? We went on yeah, the phone. I was surprised. Yeah. We went on the phone and then we went on Clubhouse uh, to kind of do it as well, didn't we? Yeah, and I spoke to each of you about this, either on the phone or in person, because um, I would, you know, just I like to mix it up, you know. Yeah, and, um, definitely. Um, and I think that, or sometimes I will have I've joined in Zoom audio only, uh, and sometimes out and about, or just in an unusual place, like sitting in the park, and um, 
and I think that's really interesting about Clubhouse, just the and and you know platforms like it. Where you could you you could be in the bathroom you I'm in the bathtub I mean not bathroom I'm bathtub I meant yeah. or washing your dishes or cooking your dinner or out walking yeah. or whatever like you can just be kind of in and in amongst the conversation wherever you are and you don't have to worry about oh is my makeup on or am I dressed or you could be in your jammies you could be in bed whatever so I mean that's one awesome thing about the audio only from my standpoint. And and actually, you know, you had made the great suggestion when we first talked about this session that you and I um, should do some clubhouse discussions, and um, and it was really, you know, I I want to do more. Um, I then had to, I had this fanciful notion that when I was away working on location with my production company, I'd be able to join in from intriguing places that I was. Um, and it didn't work out like that because I was like run off my feet. But um, but I like I wanted to join in from Orkney um, oh, before yeah. going to the sound archive to record some gigs. But um, uh, but you're, for, you're forgiven. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I'd like to come back. And um, we well, should all well, do it. Continue the conversation. We could do yeah. it after later today. We could do a clubhouse. There you go. An after yeah, party I'm, on clubhouse. Absolutely. You know, and um, and I think that. Um, you know, there was one time that we did it that I then um, I said, well, God, I, I better get home because I've got to, to go and pick the kids up from their woodcraft folk session or something. And I thought, well, this is great. I can just keep talking while we're, you know, while I walk home because I don't need exactly. to turn off the video or... Um, <laughs> Um, there was a question. Sorry. Um, Duncan's asking, um, is Clubhouse only on Apple? So it did start out only on Apple and I'm not Apple. I'm Android. So when I first got the invite to join Clubhouse, I'm like, damn it, I don't I don't have an app. And then I was like later a week later, I was like, wait, I have an iPad. So I went initially on on my iPad, but eventually the pressure was so much that they're now Android as, as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I went from being on it every single day to being on it. Sunday nights for the Ted Lasso chat. And occasionally, like before this panel, I thought I'm going to go on last night. And I went into a room. I ended up talking to people. I went up, they got invited up on stage. I don't know who these people were, but I was like, okay, sure, whatever. And I ended up connecting with all the people that were on stage on LinkedIn later and had some conversations. And I went out of that one into another one. So you can kind of, you can make connections if whatever, you can use it however you want. I like to use it for networking, but you don't have to. You can use it just for interest, just lurking and listening, you, or you can go up on stage and share your story and get to know people through those storytelling live kind of thing. Well, um, we've got one one of our audience, uh, Duncan, is uh, he's in for the, the you yeah. know, after party you've proposed. So we'll do that at <laughs> six o'clock today on Clubhouse, connect with Theo or I, if you want to join in. Do it, um, seriously. That's a great uh, idea. Yeah, we'll do it. Um, and it, in terms of, you know, using audio in a discussion way to uh, as part of content creation and um, uh, connecting with people and recording remotely, is that something, Dan, that you do um, a lot of like, as well as, you know, you, I imagine a lot of your programs, you're going out and you're interviewing people first person um, live in person, but... Um, have you, and throughout the pandemic, done a lot more remote recording and discussion? Yeah, we have. Um, I think there's not much that can be good said about the pandemic, but one good thing, um, I think, is that it's actually pushed technology's boundaries pretty hard. Um, we mentioned there Zoom fatigue. Everyone was using Zoom in those early days of March 2020. And um, from an audio producer's point of view, Zoom audio is not good. It's not good audio mm. at all. Um, but technology has advanced in the last two years so much that actually you can get, um, when we weren't able to go and travel and meet people in a face-to-face -face environment, um, you there are other platforms, other ways of um, recording remotely that give you really good quality you don't you do not have to settle for poor quality just because you're doing it um remotely um online platforms but colby mentioned uh, earlier on about technology you know there are some fantastic apps which will record in good quality for smartphones there are microphones that you can plug into your smartphone as well and that adage of your quality is only ever going to be as good as from a technical point of view as to what you put in um, 
if you can get the best possible mic for the the environment or the situation you're in then then that will work it will give you better quality um so yeah it it has changed the landscape has changed a lot um there is nothing better than being able to go out and record with somebody um face to face um in the environment if that's what the story brings to it or if that's what adds to the story but to be able to go and respond to someone and, and give them those um the nuances of body language or the nod when you're recording when they're telling you a story or or to be able to to leave a pause to get people to keep telling you more whereas if you try and do it on a platform like this they go well hold on have, I, have, you, have you frozen or have i frozen is that my question <laughs> No, that's the pregnant pause. Keep yeah. speaking. No, you don't get that in yeah. the remote virtual world. Um, you do when you're sitting down with someone or you're going for a walk with someone. Um, they will naturally fill that void. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's a way. It's 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 a different way of doing it. But actually, you know, you can get good quality audio. Um, remotely nowadays and I'm pleased to see Colby nodding his head and agreeing with me um, from his perspective as the, the technologist but um, yeah it, it it was a boundary back in March 2020 I remember some absolute nightmare productions and workarounds um, but now it's an awful lot easier and tools like Anchor make it incredibly easier. I just, I didn't, hadn't even noticed they were bought by Spotify, missed that memo. Um, but I've kind of dabbled with, with podcasts myself. And, and then I went back and like last month, I'm like, I'm going to resurrect my podcast, which I hadn't done for two years. Like I started it and sat for two years because a lot of people I think do, but um, with Anchor, you can record right into it. You can add the music right into it. You can do all of it right inside on your smartphone these days. So don't let the technology technology be the barrier of like, oh, I haven't got a good enough, whatever. You probably do have a good enough to at least get started and then upgrade as you go. That would be my tip. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, I think technology has, uh, um, much like it has in the music industry, with intermediated production. Um, so like uh, bands and musicians can uh, make albums um, on very low budgets by themselves. Um, the increase in technology in uh, in other areas of audio production um, has disintermediated that, so that people can uh, make podcasts or long and short form audio content uh, much more easily than perhaps they could have done before. You know, to give you to give you an example, we worked with um, Jenny Graham, the uh, who holds the Round the World Women's Self Unsupported Round the World Cycle record. She's based in Inverness. Um, and just before we set up, she set off, we set her up with um, her smartphone and a, a little lav mic, a lapel mic, um, which she broke within about an hour of leaving the start line in Berlin. And so instead, she just plugged her iPhone headphones in and she talked and she just recorded as she talked. And even something as good as the standard um, plug in, not the Bluetooth, the standard plug in headphones you get with a smartphone. That mic is better than nothing. Um, I would be cagey of Bluetooth, but that's different. And Jenny recorded around the world with that. She sent stuff back um, through um, uploading it to the cloud whenever she could get a signal. Um, and, and then we developed the production from there for a, a podcast for her. And we're gonna go and do the same thing um, later on this year, hopefully, with someone who's crossing a, doing an expedition across a desert. Um, and so, so long as we can control the wind in the desert in the sort of late afternoon um, and they can get connectivity they can record into their smartphone and it's basically a storage device and then put it into the cloud and we can get it back here in the highlands and start turning the production around that that's brilliant um, i love the idea of reports from the desert and um and it, what you're saying about the headphones it's a bit like um the, that saying that you know the best camera is the one you got with you you know sure. and um uh, uh having great tools is wonderful but um just have it the, again coming back to that immediacy of audio um as a medium and um uh i'll, I'll um check out that podcast um about the round the world cycle a friend of mine from school cycled from 
Thailand to Scotland and um, uh, and she did it as a, a kind of a campaign to raise awareness about mental health and suicide prevention and she um, she blogged about it she took lots of photos but one my favorite bit of what she did um, was recorded some uh, audio diary um, excerpts and um, published that published them on um, platform that we were intrigued by is going back 10 12 years um audio boo uh, mm-hmm. which um uh, does it's not around as that anymore but the but the um uh, the little diary excerpts that she did were wonderful because they were so immediate um and um platform development uh, is that kind of led by What's happening with the content? You think, Colby, or or is that, or is user experience enabling what people can do um, on the platforms or with the platforms? Um, so I, I obviously can't speak for every platform, but um, certainly, sure, yeah. um, your perspective. Uh, Scrap Sounds is very uh, driven by product needs rather than um, fancy technology. Um, mm. I mean, we do have a lot of fancy technology. Don't get me wrong, but um, we we don't. Um, build anything without a clear product requirement for it. Um, and so we have a uh, you know, um, committee and editors specifically for BBC Sounds, and they are out there looking for interesting stories and uh, interesting audio content and um, uh, you know, ways to highlight and show. Um, and it's our role as technologists to um, build the infrastructure that allows those stories to be told. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, to answer your question, um, uh, it's very much driven by what the, the user of the product needs. Um, and uh, in terms of the way that platforms have enabled um, audio, uh, Thea, that's something that you, um, you've you really got into. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that was a nice way of putting it, a very delicate and tactful way. I, I definitely embraced a voice on every single channel. So um, from messaging people on LinkedIn through voice messenger, a, a lot of times I do it, people go, I didn't even know you could send voice messages on LinkedIn. These are private messages to people. But um, I do it on um obviously WhatsApp all day, every day. It's how I communicate with my friends and family around the world is usually by voice because sometimes it's a pain to type in phone, especially if you're old like me. Um, and voice, cause voice is just so much better. And, and coming back to that quote I did, it gives that intonation and you can know when somebody's being cheeky, funny, sad, angry, whatever and stuff. Cause you can tell through the voice, but um, I use it even to communicate with some fellow Canva experts. I've got one in Israel and one in Canada and all day long, we're messaging each other through voice asking questions like, what should we do about this? Or I've got a customer that's got that, you know, and we're constantly using it in a business support way. And I know that you can do it on things like Slack or Discord and these kinds of things. I haven't really embraced those ones, but I do it everywhere else, pretty much. Absolutely. All day, every day using voice rather than typing in. It's really interesting that the platforms have all, you know, so many major um, social platforms have got on that. And enabled that and um you know because video when the platforms got into video and everybody started challenging youtube then it seemed like everyone was obsessed with video and video is the future of the internet and the internet's all going to be about video but um audio has never gone away and the you know podcasts have kind of like there was an initial interest and then it seemed to slump and then exploded again with especially with a lot of true crime stuff and serial particularly and you know that re awakened everybody's interest in it and then you every now and again you get a big star like joe rogan or something well you know but you um i mean dan you mentioned right back to the start ira glass and the you know some amazing podcast networks have sprung up come maybe coming out of public service broadcasting um and um it's just what well, you know enduringly popular but where um where do you think it's it's going or what do you think um could be the future for audio <laughs> medium if if i could look through a crystal ball goodness me that would be good for someone who's just set up their own company wouldn't it um, <laughs> uh 
I don't know, it's difficult to tell. You know, when when we went into lockdown, um, radio figures went up um, because that's where people were getting information from. Um, podcast listening also went up um, significantly. As we came out of lockdown, generally, I think podcast figures have sort of become a bit static or stable. So who knows um, what will happen next? But there is no doubt that it will keep on evolving and um, new platforms, new ways will um, will emerge. I think in terms of our consumption, how will we as individuals do it? I think it's going to be quite hard for people to kind of get away from listening through these things. And these things have changed how we listen to audio because um, gone are the days when I used to think of speaking to a broad audience. I now speak to an individual audience. You have to remember your your smartphone or wherever you get your audio from, that device is a really personal space. I mean, would you hand over your smartphone to, to anyone go, here's my code, fill your boots, go for whatever you want. But as a podcast producer, when you subscribe to a podcast, you enable me to come into that personal space of yours. Mm. And I have to respect that. And so you make a physical decision to enable me to come into your space and then you listen. And so that's a real privilege as a producer, creating audio. So wherever it goes, as a producer, you need to think about your audience all the time because they are key. And you only need to listen to something for five minutes and not really enjoy it. And you go unsubscribe and remove from library. And you've lost that listener. You've lost that um, bit of audience. So I think audience expectation audience desires and the way the audience consume will probably drive where we go next and what that is again give me the crystal ball and i'll, I'll thank you very much for it but it's can all I, about the audience this is I, all about the audience sorry yeah i didn't mean to butt in on you sorry there dan um but speaking of consuming i consume almost all content at 1.5 or 1.75 speed so um i'm somebody that likes really short form content when i see a podcast is over an hour or something i'm like oh it might take me four days to listen to a one hour podcast so again i would say mix up your content if you're creating content do some short some long. I mean, short is definitely a big trend at the moment, YouTube shorts and your reels and your stories and that kind of stuff. So mix it up if you're if you're creating content would be my advice. Yeah, and Colby, what um where do you see in so you know the the development of, of audio from a platform sense? Yeah, I mean I think um uh, one of the things that we're Kind of focusing on with sounds is a uh, greater personalization of uh of our offering and that's definitely um, a major driver of uh, um uh, most platforms i mean spotify uh, you know, probably familiar to most people of, of um, their algorithms and how scarily accurate they can be uh, predicting your music taste um, applying that kind of um, personalization to long and short form uh, uh, audio content um, could be a very powerful um, uh, way to get and um, cut across to uh, people that are perhaps underserved at the moment. Um, uh, the, the sort of ideal experience for me anyway would be that you could um, turn on uh, BBC Sounds, hit the play button, and it already kind of knows what you're interested in and would present to you uh, well and short form audio content in a similar manner to how linear radio currently does that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, as as technology improves and as the product improves, um, I would hope that the the, um, the lean back experience, I suppose you would call that, of linear radio, it, um, can be replicated with more on demand content. Yeah, that would be fascinating. Um, that kind of that level of personalization, but emulating the the live experience. Well, that is us at time. Um, we could keep talking. We would like to keep talking. And so we will, you know, Thea, thank you for suggesting that. We'll do the, the after party this evening at six. For anyone who can join in, please do. Um, and thank you all very much. Thank you, Thea, Dan, Colby, and very much for um, uh, joining me on this um, fascinating 
uh, in discussion about an enduringly popular medium which will never go away and um, has internal value for all of us. And thank you for everybody for for um, listening and uh, and viewing and enjoy the rest of Expo North. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.